This series presents information based in part on theory and conjecture. The producer's purpose is to suggest some possible explanations, but not necessarily the only ones, to the mysteries we will examine. She was the most desirable woman in the world, the fabled Helen, wife to the Prince of Sparta. So beautiful was she that a rival prince stole her away to the kingdom of Troy. Thus, Helen became the face that launched a thousand ships, each ship carrying a hundred Greek warriors bent on revenge. For ten years, the ships were beached while the army laid siege to Troy. The great walls of the city could not be breached, but the Greeks found another way. Were Helen and the Battle of Troy just the dreams of an ancient poet? The place where Europe ends and Asia begins is as mysterious as its mountains are imposing. Where they meet the sea, rich farmlands were for centuries protected by great stone battlements. The ancient Greeks called this land Ionia. Modern men call it Turkey. Relatively few Westerners travel to Turkey these days. Fewer still venture into the exotic countryside beyond the graceful minarets of Istanbul. A long time ago, things were different. What we now call Turkey once seemed to be the great crossroads of the known world. Adventurers from all over the Mediterranean sailed for her shores. What were they looking for? Ten centuries before Christ, the Greeks were just beginning to probe the strange seacoast that lay to the east. The inhabitants of Ionia were said to be rich in precious metals and trade goods from even more distant lands. Eventually, the Greeks would establish colonies, new cities, and a new civilization. Even as the new cities prospered, however, mainland Greece was on the brink of collapse. For a time, the colonies represented the only real hope for the future. The Greek settlers had brought with them their pantheon of gods. Clearly, the Greeks of this troubled period wanted to keep alive the glories of the past. With their gods came mortal heroes, somehow bridging the gulf between heaven and earth. Of these heroes, it was said, each could do what two men could not do, such as now live upon the earth. No one helped preserve these illusions more than the great bard, Homer. Some scholars believe Homer traveled through the great cities of Ionia in the 8th century before Christ. As he would pass through a city, he would pause to recite a tale or hear one told. Under graceful columns and along busy thoroughfares, storytellers would gather to recite verse. Perhaps it was in this way that Homer first heard the story of Troy. He may have visited the place where the great battle was supposed to have happened. Whether Troy's location was known to Homer or not, he certainly drew inspiration for his retelling of the story from the countryside of its birth. The result was Homer's epic poem, The Iliad. The poem described the invasion of the Greeks but nowhere does it mention the gift horse filled with soldiers. By the 18th century, most scholars had concluded that the fall of Troy described by Homer was pure fiction or related to something that happened somewhere else. Many felt that Homer never lived at all, that the work ascribed to him was merely an anthology of folk tales told by many writers. There were a few eccentrics, however, who believed otherwise. The most remarkable of these was a self-made millionaire named Heinrich Schliemann. As a boy, Schliemann had taught himself to read the Iliad in Greek. His fascination with Homer's poem was to become a lifelong obsession. 
By 1870, Schliemann had made two fortunes in Russia and another in the California gold fields. He arrived in Turkey determined to spend every penny of his great wealth, if need be, on realizing his dream, the discovery of ancient Troy. When Schliemann committed himself to an objective, it was with an all-consuming passion uncommon in average men. As Schliemann began his search, he looked over the plain that might once have played host to the armies of Hector and Achilles. Schliemann came armed with the Iliad and took up residence in the small village of Bunar Bashi. The few scholars who were prepared to even consider the possibility that Troy once existed generally placed it here. So he began his survey of the Turkish countryside looking for landmarks mentioned by Homer. Schliemann had given himself a good layman's education in archaeology. An examination of the area others thought likely revealed nothing to his eye that could possibly relate to Homer's Troy. The springs which Homer described weren't of much help either. Surely their course must have changed dozens of times in the 30 or more centuries since Troy. Before giving up on Bunar Bashi, Schliemann decided on another test. Homer had said precisely how long it took Achilles to chase Hector around the walls. There was only one thing for Schliemann to do. Wrong. The time was wrong. Bunarbashi just didn't fit Homer's facts. Schliemann's detractors had a field day, more convinced than ever that he was a fool or simply crazy. Even Schliemann had to admit he'd picked a big haystack in which to search for his needle. But a grocer's apprentice who had the brains and energy to make himself a multi-millionaire doesn't quit easily. He began to search again, a short distance north of Bunarbashi. There, he would encounter his destiny on a hill called Hisalik. The site was less than an hour's march from the sea. If well fortified, it could command the whole plain below. Even an eye less astute than his couldn't miss the archaeological evidence. Schliemann was convinced he had realized a 40-year-old dream. In his journal, he wrote, I have set foot on Trojan soil at last. He selected the highest mound on Hisserlich and ordered his men to dig. Homer had said the Temple of Athena stood on the highest ground in the city, ringed by walls built by the gods. Still, the critics scoffed. Although Schliemann had taught himself to read and write 18 languages, the scholars of the day dismissed him as an unlettered boor, living in a fantasy world. Schliemann only worked harder, driving his men to dig deeper into the mound. Surely now he would find the proof to quiet those who laughed. Find it, he did. Here, indisputably, were the remnants of a lost civilization. But were they the fabled walls of Troy? Schliemann's trove of artifacts shook the academic world. What must the builders of this city have been like? What hands made these beautiful things? Clearly, the ancient craftsmen used techniques more advanced than many in use today. 
Why did they vanish after accomplishing so much? Schliemann discovered hundreds of spindle whorls, just like the ones still favored by local residents for spinning wool yarn. Other implements were found, similar if not identical to those in everyday use by villagers along the Turkish coast. Schliemann might have been struck by how little some things change in 3,000 years. But he would need more to prove his city was the Troy of Homer. Heinrich Schliemann's life had been one long love affair with the legend of Troy. It had taken four years to excavate the ruin he thought was Troy. Now, as he walked its ancient pavements, he believed he was following the path Homer had taken so long ago. Schliemann seeing, as through Homer's eyes, the skilled Trojan craftsmen at work in their stalls. Touching a dish that might have been set before Helen, the hostage princess who spawned ten years of war. Admiring a lion's head carved in crystal, what great warrior might have carried it as a charm into battle? Schliemann could place on his own hand a ring made 30 centuries ago. Restore a brush whose bristles had turned to dust in the age of gods who walked with men. Still, Schliemann was not satisfied. He had in fact discovered nine cities. He had no way of knowing for sure which one was the city of his dreams. Some early inhabitants imported bronze cast in ingots the shape of ox hides. They were ships anchors of chiseled stone and ships cook stoves of bronze. These Schliemann found in the ruin he called Troy II. But was this Homer's Troy? The answer was obscured by evidence of a great catastrophe. Violence more terrible than war had seared the very masonry of the walls. Jewelry was fused into shapeless blobs of metal. The whole countryside must have been laid waste by the disaster. Those who survived lived in squalor. The floors of their huts built on compacted garbage. If nothing else, Schliemann had unearthed a monument to the tenacity of man. Fire and sword had raged. Again and again, a city of the living had been raised on a city of the dead. Schliemann numbered the ruins from one for the oldest to nine for the most recent. He assumed his objective was among the older ruins, possibly Troy II. Yet in Troy VI, he found massive walls that could have been the ones described by Homer. If they were the walls that hid Helen from the armies of her betrayed husband, it would be easy to see why the battle raged ten years. It all seemed to fit Homer's description. A city fashioned by the gods. Yet the design of houses in Troy VI was remarkably similar to those of the more ancient second city. A major difference among the various ruins seemed to be evidence of the increasing influence of outside cultures. By the time of Troy VI, newcomers from the north were introducing a completely new kind of pottery. The other arts were also affected by the immigrants. Alexander the Great was a latecomer to Troy, but among the first to build an altar to the old gods. From inscriptions, it is clear Alexander read Homer as fact. More years passed, and the Romans became masters of the Ionian coast. The poet Virgil took up in Latin 
where Homer left off in Greek. Embellishing the story and giving it new credibility, Rome made Troy a sacred city. Emperors came to worship and be entertained. Augustus even considered making Troy the capital of his empire. Through it all, minstrels kept alive Homer's poem of glory. This was the world Heinrich Schliemann felt he had rediscovered. But was he seeing only what he wanted to see? So complete was Schliemann's dedication to Homer's Troy that he had taken a young Greek woman to be his bride. He thought she had Helen's blood coursing through her veins. And in a way, all this effort had been intended to restore her heritage. The greatest prize he had not been able to give her. Yet as he was about to give up, Schliemann made his most fantastic discovery. The glint of metal had caught his eye. Schliemann ordered his wife to send the workers away. Sophia was confused, but she had come to trust her husband's uncanny instincts. She did as she was told. Kocamın yaş günü bugün. Hey Paydos! 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 In four years, Schliemann's men had moved 325,000 cubic yards of earth. Now, he was moving alone, deep into the excavation of the ancient second city. 28 feet down was the lower level of the wall Schliemann identified with Homer's palace of Troy. It was here he had seen the flash of treasure. Schliemann had chanced everything for his dream. Even with all he'd accomplished, scholars still considered him a fraud or a madman. Now, he knew they would have to believe him. The treasure of Troy was surely only inches from his grasp. Then, his fingers touched it. were 31 large objects of beaten gold. Had this once adorned Helen, daughter of the gods? The workmanship was unmistakable. Surely this was all the proof the world would need. The hoard included 9,000 small pieces, rings, buttons and charms. It was wealth beyond imagining. More important, it seemed that a lifetime's quest had finally been realized. In spite of promises to share the treasure with the Turkish government, Schliemann smuggled most of it out of the country. He held onto it long enough to dress Sophia in splendor. Somehow, Schliemann knew he had fulfilled his destiny and hers by finding the lost treasure of Troy. The collection eventually found its way to the Berlin Museum. Schliemann would go on to other triumphs in archaeology. The Trojan treasure, however, would vanish. In the closing days of World War II, the Americans and the Russians marched on Berlin from opposing flanks. The museum fell under Russian control, but the treasure was already gone. Someone may have hidden it from the bombardment, then died without revealing the secret of its location. It's possible the Nazis stole it for their own use in the headlong flight from the advancing Allies. No one really knows. Happily, perhaps, Schliemann didn't live to see the day that the prize he struggled so hard to win would vanish again without a trace. Little has changed in Turkey in the hundred years since Heinrich Schliemann came here to play out his dream of finding Troy. Caravans still follow trade routes that were ancient even in Homer's day. Old men still sit in the shade and tell stories. 
It is the custom here, and was so long before Homer's time. Tragedy and disaster are also familiar in this fabled land. In 1976, an earthquake killed hundreds of people and left thousands homeless. There was no warning, just sudden and savage destruction. A dazed and heartbroken people began to rebuild, even as they mourned their dead. Modern archaeologists believe the same fate overtook ancient Troy. That around 1300 BC, a violent earthquake leveled the mighty city. Before the city could be rebuilt, barbarians attacked from the north and put the survivors to the sword. Perhaps we can be forgiven for preferring to believe that Troy met its end gloriously and for the sake of love. <laughs>